Welcome, my name is Mark Anthony Neal, the James B. Duke Professor of African and African American Studies at Duke University and a lifelong New York Mets fan. And I'm honored to host a conversation today uh, with our guests talking about uh, everything from uh, history in terms of black history and, and what it means in the context of contemporary America. Let me introduce our guest this afternoon, nicknamed the Sage, he's the second African American manager in franchise history and managed the team from 2008 to 2010. Currently, he's running the Jerry Manuel Foundation, which targets urban youth, educating them with charter school standards and training them in the fundamentals of baseball. Please welcome Mr. Jerry Manuel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Former All-Star and fan favorite, he played 17 seasons in the league. He is currently a baseball analyst who co-hosts on the Sirius XM radio and appears on MLB Network. Please welcome Cliff Floyd. Thank you. And finally, producer and journalist at NBC Universal, where she writes and produces various segments for the network. She is the daughter of 1969 world champion, Net <clears throat> Tommy Agee. Please welcome Janelle oh. Agee. Hi, Hello. how are you? Good, nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you. Hello. Oh, wow. Nice to be here with all of you. And let me start, I, I was stuck. You know, most recently the Mets did a clip called What If? which imagine a world without black baseball players. Um, and, and I'm gonna direct this first to Cliff. Um, how aware were you as young players coming into the league of the role, those early pioneers like Larry Doby and Jackie Robinson and, and the greats of the Negro Leagues? How aware of you, were you of them when you were coming into the league? I mean, for me, um, coming up in a small town in Markham, Illinois, about 40 minutes outside of Chicago, we actually had opportunities to go to Jackie Robinson Field. Our coach, my coach, um, may he rest in peace, um, Mr. Moses Harris was incredible as far as just giving us the understanding of who Jackie Robinson was and what we needed to do to, uh, you know, understand what he, what he did for us. So he was huge in that area. So we, we knew of Jackie Robinson. Um, as far, as far as other iconic names, uh, the Negro League, we, we we didn't know too much, but coming up, it was in our heads as youngsters. And if you paid attention to detail, you 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 could you you knew who paid the way for us. Um, but I think when you got to the league and when you got to started playing ball, I think it was I think we became oblivious, and 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 not rightfully so. It's just. You was trying to make it so hard in, in, in a world that you didn't see a lot of color. It was tough for us to sort of recognize and understand the, the importance of, of, of what we are today. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate, but I still think it's never too late to still understand who paved the way and, and, and understand who some of the greats uh, of the Negro League and some of the great African American players that played. First, let me tell you, Janelle. My dad was a National League guy um, and, and loved himself some Mets, you know. So the only thing I heard in the house growing up in the Bronx, right, you know, we're 15 minutes from Yankee Stadium, but he's a Met fan. Um, and the only thing he ever talked about was Tommy Agee and Cleon Jones and, of course, mm -hmm. Willie when he got traded over, you know. So I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk with you. But when your father came into the league, you know, the league was about, you know, 10 percent black. By the time he retired, it was 17% black and, and it gets to this high point in 1975, almost 20%. Um, how aware do you think your father was, you know, in terms of inspiring a generation of young blacks, you know, to go into the sport? Um, I think he was highly aware about, you know, being in Major League Baseball and being one of those only blacks to come in at the time he did. You know, he comes from Mobile, Alabama, where a number of great baseball players came from Cleon and Satchel Paige and mm -hmm. Hank Aaron and Willie mm -hmm. McCovey. So where he grew up, baseball was around him all the time. So going into the league, he had those mentors to look up to. And I remember him talking about, you know, his first team and which was the Cleveland Indians. And his first roommate was Jim Mudcat Grant. 
who is one of the pitchers, only black pitchers to win 20 games in a season. And he became a mentor to him. So I think after my dad passed away or after my dad, you know, left the league, he really wanted to mentor younger players. So I remember going to the Shea Stadium all the time and, you know, being on the field and him talking to the players and giving them the feedback of a player that was, you know, playing during the civil rights era and one of the only blacks during the time when he was around. So I think it had a great, you know, the influence that he had on players and the influence that players before him had on him meant a great deal to him. Yeah, I, I think sometimes it's it's amazing to think about with that generation of players, particularly those in the late 1960s, but everything that was happening in civil rights, what it meant, must have been like to try to navigate, you know, playing the game on the one hand, um, but also remaining connected to what's happening in the streets, for lack of a better way to describe it. And I think sometimes we think of sports and baseball, you know, as a safe haven from real world issues. But I think some of the stuff that we saw this past summer, I'm thinking particularly around the way the team rallied around Dom Smith, you know, after the George Floyd thing, you know, there's sometimes where things come up and, and you have to be engaged. And, and I'm wondering for you, you know, manager Jerry, you know, what it was like as a manager when stuff came up. And, and I'm thinking about the fact that you were on the coaching staff, you know, when Carlos Delgado came over um, mm -hmm. and he had had a long history of, of protesting, you know, around mm -hmm. Viejas, you know, including the fact sometimes he wouldn't stand, you know, for the, for the national anthem. Um, what was it like for you as a manager um, trying to find a way and a coach, right, to be able to talk about these real world issues either publicly or in the clubhouse? Well, uh, thanks for having me, first of all. But I think uh, for me, I'm a little bit older, so I'm a little bit closer to uh, the Negro League uh, mm -hmm. issue. My dad played in the Negro Leagues for a brief moment. And um, so I, I knew when I was coming into coaching, I was coming in not as a superstar, uh, a black superstar player, I was coming in as a person that knew the strategy uh, of the game very well. That's, that's what I studied, uh, was, was, was the strategy of the game. And I, I just recollect one incident what we had in Chicago where we were going to Birmingham to play an exhibition game uh, before the start of the season. And one of the guys uh, said he refused to go. And the general manager come to me, the owner comes to me and said, hey, uh, I got to suspend your guy. I won't mention any names, but uh, he said he won't make the trip. So um, he comes in and we have a conversation. I said, why you won't make the trip? He said, that's where they put the hoses on my, uh, on my parents. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not going, I'm not going to be going on this trip. I said, well, you know what? Uh, forgiveness can free you of a lot of things. So I think if you forgive, uh, it gives, it, it gives, it, it lifts, a, it lifts some, somewhat of a weight off of you that you're carrying that could free you up to even be a better player. So he eventually came down and I said, hey, okay, cool. I'll just give you one at back. Let you, you don't have to sign any autograph, one at back, get back in the clubhouse, do what you gotta do, and that's it. And uh, so these things uh, came up very often. I also recollect one time a Chicago radio station saying that, uh, it must be after Martin Luther King Day, Jerry playing all the blacks. I'm saying wow. I, I never even looked at it that way, but wow. uh, I was kind of I was kind of proud of that, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was kind of proud of that. I said, dang, if I could get more of these, then you know, we, 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 we might have a shot. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that, that those um those experiences and, 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 and that uh, experience as being a manager, you know, offered you <clears throat> obviously certain privileges, but once you return home, some of those privileges left because they didn't know who you were or what you was connected with. And I think that's where we sometimes uh, lose sight of the battle of what we were trying to accomplish is, is to get us back into the game and to let the young players know now, you are privileged now. You got the charter flight, you got the big hotel, but once that's gone, bro, you got to go back to, the, to, to home and you got to be you. 
And to be you, you can make a difference because you have influence. You take that and, and use it as a influential position. So that, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at with that, uh, <clears throat> with that stand. You know, Janelle, your dad was in the league, you know, during the Watts riots when Martin Luther King and, and Robert Kennedy assassinated, you know, when Hank Aaron is chasing down Babe Ruth and getting all this racist, you know, mail, you know, targeted at him. Did, did he ever talk about what it was like to play in the league during the civil rights era? He would hint at it, but he wouldn't really necessarily tell stories, but other players would. So I would talk to Cleon Jones and who I call Uncle Cleon. <laughs> and, you know, he would talk about, we didn't necessarily protest and go out in the streets, but our protest was on the field. Our protest was our bats and all of the accomplishments that we had. So, you know, Growing up down in Mobile, they had a sense of what they had to do during that time. And so their lane was, how can I improve baseball? Mm -hmm. How can I show that Blacks can make a way and pivot and show that we can make, you know, significant accomplishments within this sport? And so I think that that's, that was their mentality, those Black players during that time um, that my dad played. Yeah, I mean, Cliff, you're, you're pretty outspoken now, and, and I recall you being outspoken as a player, uh, what was it like for you navigating some of these issues, you know, when they bubbled up? Um, I'm thinking you were probably in the league during the LA riots and, and things of that nature. Um, what was it like for you? You know, Mark, I think the biggest thing for me is, man, just sitting here looking at Jerry, um, it takes me all the way back to, to the 90s. And it takes me back because I got the opportunity to be around Jerry and if you listen to how he speaks, he's always been the same guy. And this is no, you know, buttercup and, you know, and showing, you know, love because he's sitting here. But, but I, I had him, and I look at that as a luxury because a lot of cats don't get the opportunity to have the influential guy like Jerry in, 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 in front of me when my dad is at home mm -hmm. in Markham, Illinois, it's like, you need a second pop. You need a second, you know, father figure um, to to guide you and to, to to show you. And it was it wasn't just Jerry. It was Tommy Harper, and you know, it was so many different cats that you look back on your career and go, "What if I ain't had these dudes? <clears throat> you know, what if you didn't stay grounded and understand what you just asked about? You know, the LA riots and and what was going on because." You mentioned the, the percentage of, of African Americans in the game back when I was, it was 3%. So your peers were white. So if you don't stay grounded by having good surroundings of your coaches uh, that's, that's, that's keeping you grounded, man, you lose focus on who you are. And that was the one thing before I left my house. My dad said, baseball, you play, son, but that's not who you are. Don't come back here a different dude. I thought, dang, well, how am I do that? You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I'm about to go play the sport that's, you know, predominantly white, and I don't know what's gonna happen. But, you know, if I didn't have, you know, just great peers around, people around, like you know, Jerry and um, Tommy Harper, and we had a, we had a, we had a team, Marquise Grissom, Randy, Mill, like, like mm -hmm. I had good dudes I can go back. You know, and, and like in my back pocket, and just pick out like these cats guided me, man, and and kept me grounded. And and I think through the whole, my, you know, when when you when you play a ball and you out of your element, the outside world, Mark, don't really like it. Don't hit you as hard as you as as you would think it would hit you. Like today, we have social media. Mm -hmm. So we have all these things. It's, it's easy for us to look at and find and be like, okay, mm -hmm. here it is. But back then we didn't have that luxury. So mm -hmm. everything we did was based on like, I have to, like, I, I'm not, I'm, I mean, think about what, where we are. I, I have to make a living. I have right. to, right. I have to grind every day. I got to stay quiet because so you you can tell him so that I mean that was the main thing. He was like, boy, you better go play and shut yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. So I think the worldly stuff, man. I mean, if you're keeping it 100, like 
Like it really didn't really, it couldn't, it, it didn't, it didn't get to us like it does today. Okay. And you know what I'm saying? It, it, now, do I wish? Absolutely. Because now, it, now these young cats understand their platform and they're mm -hmm. using it to their ability and, and mm -hmm. they're doing a really good job of it. Um, had we known the platform we had, then I for sure would have been standing there front and center, speaking, you know, speaking on equality. I ain't touching that field. You know, Soup would have been like, well, you better get I ain't touching that field. <laughs> We wouldn't, we wouldn't have been, we wouldn't been touching that field. You yeah, know, we yeah. had strong minded Markham, Illinois, uh, Marquise was from Georgia. Yeah. You know, uh, hey, 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 Jerry, what was, what was Delano from? Uh, Seaford, Delaware. The, you know what I'm saying, Mark? So we had these cats from these small town, but you know, it was, <clears> um, <throat> so we had, we, we knew what we stood for. It was just the worldly stuff wasn't really hitting us like that. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Um, I, I was fortunate to have Marcus Stroman as a student when he was down at Duke. Um, and, you know, you look at these college baseball teams and you even look at the league now and, and, and black kids playing baseball are like unicorns. You know, my, my daughter just graduated from the University of Illinois at Chicago last year and, and she's had a boyfriend for the last three years and he played baseball for the University of Chicago, University of Illinois Chicago baseball team, same you know team that Granderson played for. Right. And she done brought all these boyfriends to me. It's like, yeah, whatever. She brought this dude. I'm like, oh, he played baseball? <laughs> right. you know, we, we, He's a keeper. We, we keeping him. <laughs> um, but I raise that to the fact that, you know, with the appeal of basketball and the NFL, and, and this isn't a brand new thing, no. The, the difficulty, we don't see a lot of black kids playing baseball now. Uh, I'm down here in North Carolina and the North Carolina Central HBCU, you know, they're cutting their baseball program at the end of this year. But the irony is that the majority of the kids on the baseball team aren't black. Mm. Right? They're, they're mm. white and la Latino kids. What can be done at this moment to make the sport more attractive to young folks? Um, and also, you know, what kind of life lessons can be learned by taking up a sport like baseball? Jerry, Jerry, you got to hit this one first, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think the 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 life one of the one of the life lessons is uh, baseball will teach you humility, and humility is a characteristic that exalts. If uh, if you can deal with the failure, which uh, you know we as a people see failure a little different than say the other side of town because this is this is this is what we where we come from. We didn't we didn't come from a lot, but when you get to the major leagues, obviously there's a lot there for you to uh, be a part of. But uh, I think I think what's what's happening now is that uh, it was it has always been a pillar of our culture, baseball. I mean, Sunday you eat uh, fried chicken, go to church, and then after that it's a game. There's a baseball game going on somewhere, you know? And, and that's what we did. I mean, we, we went to the baseball games. I mean, that was a big pillar. So I think uh, to some degree, we are somewhat responsible for the flight of uh, African-Americans leaving the game because we, assume, we, we, we chose to let them play other sports. But when they were playing those other sports, those other kids looked like them. So they wanted to be with them yeah. rather than to go over here and play and not be themselves. So we lost uh, some identity when we came that way if we weren't foundationally strong in our principles of our culture. I mean, I mean, Janelle, given what you've seen, what you saw with your father's career, um, are you surprised that, you know, black kids aren't taking up baseball anymore? I, 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 mean, I, I mean, I think about when, you're, when your dad was in the league and I was watching him, I, I just assumed, <laughs> right? like, you know, I, I'm thinking about those Pittsburgh Pirate teams, you know, which was right. like Black America's team in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you surprised that kids aren't picking up the sport anymore, right? And, and is, are there some strategies that baseball can use to be more attractive um, 
you know, to kids who want to go into the NFL to get concussions, right? Yeah. Or, or, or to go into the NBA. Mm -hmm. I am, but at the same time, I'm not. And it's, it's kind of a back and forth thing because, you know, you remember my dad and I'm sure these two remember the 69 yeah. Mets, but these are generations that are kind of leaving us. And so yeah, if you right. don't teach about, you know, players back in the 60s and back in the 50s and in the Negro League, these young players and young kids don't know about them. So they have nothing to look forward to or look up to. So mm -hmm. I am, but I'm not, because if you don't see something, you don't feel like you can do it. So yeah. you see all of these players in the NFL that are black and that are making a lot of money. And you say, I want to do that. I want to be that. But you don't see the same in Major League Baseball as you did maybe in the 70s and the 60s when there were more blacks and they were making so many, you know, prominent headway in the sport. So, you know, I, if, if there's a way to teach him, I think one of the things that stood out to me when my dad would talk about playing and be around his, his teammates was the idea of teamwork and being with a family. And so, you know, when we went back to the 50th anniversary two years ago, it was, you know, being around all of his teammates was so great because they're still telling stories and they still are, you know, talking as if they're back in the clubhouse <laughs> and, you know, sharing all of these anecdotes and, you know, cracking jokes on each other. But it was that feeling of being a part of a family, I think that felt so great for them as a team. And I think that's something that they're not relaying to kids these days. You either, you know, want to make a lot of money and go into these sports, <clears throat> or what's your other option? So I think, you know, teaching them one about, you know, the history of the sport, Blacks in the sport, Negro leagues in the sport, and then also teaching them what you can get from it. You know, the qualities of being a part of a group that helps you grow independently, but also together as a team and how you work together. I think that's kind of what's missing today. I mean, Cliff, when you came into the league, you looked like you could play tight end. Uh, you you looked <laughs> like you could still play tight end. Um, Why did you make the choice to go baseball instead of some other sports? Right? I mean, you clearly were athletic, right? And looked like you could play almost anything that, that you put your mind to. Why baseball? Man, you know what? That's a million dollar question, Mark. I don't know. I, you know, <laughs> I think, you know, Janelle hit it on the head. And I think I'll add to her is just, I was athletic. You know, um, I, trusted, I, I trusted who I was through my guidance and through the history, you know, like coming up, I didn't know how good I was. I, was, I don't think you, like when I, when I hear cats say, my dream was to get to the league. I'm like, eh, I don't know, but I, you know, maybe it is. I, I didn't have that dream. I was just, I was just gifted at being athletic, right? Skilled, didn't have all that. Couldn't teach, yeah, and you still can't teach, teach instincts. But I think to the teaching part of what Janelle, alluded to what Janelle said is, there's longevity in our sport. No Mark, you CTE is, is constant, and, and we just right. I mean, we just saw a situation uh, with Vincent Jackson. We don't right. know the case, obviously. Right. I'm not speculate on that, but th there's there's things that's happening in that sport that's just that can be tragic at the right. end. I mean, I, I just told you I was golfing just a minute ago before I came on here. I, I have my legs, my shoulders feel good. <laughs> you know, what I'm so there's longevity in this sport, um, and I, I'll, I'll tell you this, and I think this makes the most sense to me is I don't think I knew I was going to make it in the league. I had, I took baby steps. Like I was good. I had good people surroundings and then things started to click. I, I knew I could hit a fastball. I paid attention to detail. Um, Jerry was putting me at third base in all kinds of places because I couldn't play. I didn't have a set position. So he was just throwing me out over the field. So I had to get somewhere. But I think, I, I think you just, you figure it out. And I think that's what our community needs to understand. Our black communities need to understand this. We athletic, you'll figure it out. You don't, you don't, you don't have to just say, hey, you know what? I'm set at playing first base or I'm set at playing shortstop. Mm -hmm. Man, you, I, when I got drafted, it said A-T-H. I didn't know what the heck that meant, but now I figured out it meant athlete. Okay, I'm cool with that. You know what I'm because you go, you wanna, they're gonna figure out a way to, to, to maximize your potential. I think that's what we have to do in the hood 
is maximize our kids' potential mm. to be great. And the things you're not good at, cool, we'll work on those. Mm. This is, we're having this conversation uh, during the month of Black history. Um, can you talk a little bit, Jerry, about how important Black history has been to you? Well, I live it every day. I live it every day and proud to live it every day. I have no problem with it. But I, I want to reflect back on, on why the numbers are down. And I think it's a direct reflection on the travel ball industry. I mean, we're 70% single family homes. And now you got travel ball, you got to pay for lessons, you got to pay to travel, you got to do this. So the expense of playing baseball has almost eliminated us. And here's what's ironic is that they are making money at the travel ball level, but losing money at the major league level. You understand what I'm saying? That's crazy. So, yeah. so, so, so they're trying to find. So they're cutting. They're cutting back teams. Minor mm -hmm. leagues are cutting back teams. Mm -hmm. They're cutting mm -hmm. back draft picks. They're doing all these things instead of addressing the issue of the culture that is missing now from the game. That's what we need to address. Then we can get the athlete like Cliff Floyd. We can get the Ozzie Smiths that have come on the field and do a flip and say, hey, hit it to me. We can get <laughs> Dave Parker and, and all those guys. Matter of fact, today I think uh, was one of the days that they um, the Pirates fielded an all-black team. And uh, that obviously that's we're, we're away from that at, at this <laughs> point. But I, I, I think that if, if we look back, we got to go back and get to the youth and invest in the youth because uh, the events that we put on at our MLB, I mean, we have we have 200 kids that come for two weeks, all black, all black. And then when people come, like Dusty Baker come, I didn't know we had this many kids playing. I didn't know this, but and and then the parents come and say, I can't find my kid. I said that's the big thing. <laughs> <laughs> I said this is a Hank Aaron. Everybody wearing forty four, but I can't find my kid. I said this, that's a good thing. I said, that's a good thing. And uh, so I, I, I think uh, I, I've said this many times. I, I I think it has to come back around when they realize that they missing that element that we bring. We are the sauce to the gumbo. Yeah. You know, we, we bring that. We, we, we bring that flair. Yeah. That, 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 that's who we are. That's, that's another pillar of our culture. I mean, we, religion, baseball, fashion, <laughs> and dance. <laughs> Go, we can do it. <laughs> that's how baseball is, is rhythm. <laughs> if you got rhythm, you can play. If you got rhythm, you can hit. You can do these things. So, uh, you know, that's what I know I'm going a little, little off on, on what you asked me, but that, that's just that's just my take on it. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep pushing with what I'm doing to continue to not only promote uh, young kids to play, but I'm I'm trying to promote uh, guys to coach and to manage mm -hmm. at the highest level, but not get caught up in that apparatus that's already standing there to say you got to do it this way. Right. You got to do it that way. No, you be you, and we'll fit. We'll fit you into what is we consider championship player, and, and, and that's the way it has. I remember the first time Ken Griffith Jr. wore his hat backward. Everybody got all up in an uproar. <laughs> he disrespecting the game. What do you mean? That is the game. He is the right. game. Right. You don't even know it yet. That's the best thing we've had come through here since uh, since Hank and all them guys. And you talking about how he wearing his hat? Let him be free. Yeah. You know? Let him have that freedom to be him, and that's 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 what uh, what scares me about uh, some of the some of the young kids that have to change who they are for that period of time and lose and lose that culture that really got you there. Uh, so uh, it's it's a it's it's going to be a difficult challenge, but I think. Uh, eventually baseball is going to come back around and say, hey, 
we need these athletes. And, and, and it's, not a, it's not a tyranny that we're trying to form. It's just a play, it's just, that's, that's, that's who we are. I mean, I think the fear could be that if we, if we go this route, then it might be like basketball. They run things. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? They running things over there. You know, they got justice, black lives, boom, 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 <laughs> on the court, on the street. You're not gonna see much of that in baseball because it doesn't relate. Yeah. It doesn't, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, but I think it's gonna come back. I think it's yeah. gonna. I, I think it's gonna come back, and I think uh, I think we're gonna see a better game. I think the game is gonna be better, and that's all I hope for. I'm not. I'm not hoping the blacks play uh, just because blacks are not playing. I'm hoping blacks play because I want to see a better game. Right. I want to see a better game. I want to. I want all the cause Ichiro when he came over, he brought a different style of play. Uh-huh. which was entertaining. That's what I want to see. That's what we bring, you know? Uh, so, you, you know, that's how, that's how I feel about it. And I just, just feel that uh, the kids today with such limited numbers become attached to the apparatus that is there now. And then their culture gets pushed to the back and they, they lose themselves in, in, uh, the flight from the culture to somewhere else. And then they find out that that somewhere else is really don't want me there. Jerry, Jerry, keeping it 100. (laughs) Well, I mean, you should have called me. I told you, don't call me. Don't ask me no questions, please. But, but, you know, to your point, though, it's like, I mean, that's why Stroman and Tim Anderson out in Chicago are so important because they're the two two black ball players who are just being themselves. And young kids are going, oh, I can do that in baseball. I didn't know I could do that. Exactly. I can relate to that. Yes, yes, yes. But you know what though? These, 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 you know, when I'm wearing this shirt, this shirt proudly, because, you know, when you think about, I sat down with Curtis Grandison before he retired. We had a nice dinner. He talked. He talked about, you know, the second part of his career. You know, because you, this is the first part, right? And then after this, like, I got a high school education. I, I didn't. I didn't go to college. So after baseball, it's like I'm gonna set the crib, or I'm gonna figure out something else. Like, what's next, right? And I was like, look, man, you're well-spoken. You, you can do anything you want to do. I mean, you, can, you can go, you know, he did TBS in the postseason. Mm-hmm. He goes, well, I kind of want to get my feet wet. I said, well, when I got my feet wet, I did radio for three hours. You don't need to do that. You are already, you know, you, you established. He did TBS. And then he just swung open the doors to Player Alliance. Swung it open. And the only way to get traction is to be the type of person Curtis Granson is. That's the only way to gain traction in our world, to be able to be successful in something. You, you gotta be that type of person. You gotta be that dude. You gotta be, you, you gotta be super dope and you gotta be able to communicate with everybody because everybody ain't gonna be your cup of tea. You're gonna have some cast that's gonna come back with some foolishness. You're gonna have some cast that's gonna be on board. So you gotta deal with a whole bunch of everything. And when you, what, what, what Curtis can do is, keep everything level, keep everything calm, cool, and collect. And this is why for me, to, 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 to Sue's point, Jerry's point, is how the game is going to bring our kids from the inner city back to our sport. That is, we, we tried this approach that Player Alliance is, is doing a few, when I was playing. We all mm-hmm. went to New York, all the African-American players in the game, and we, and we, and, and we spoke to Bud, Bud City, our, our former commissioner. Mm-hmm. It 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 didn't come to fruition because it it didn't it, we had nothing to stand on. Like it was like, mm-hmm. hey, we hear y'all. Mm-hmm. But we was like, but you don't really hear us the way we need you to hear us. Like, yeah. what are you gonna do for the hood? Like, mm-hmm. how do we how do we keep this going? How do you make me accountable mm-hmm. when I go back home tomorrow and, and and Bob goes back to Delaware and Grip goes back to Georgia? How are you gonna mm-hmm. keep me accountable? Mm-hmm. Well, it, 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 it fell by the wayside because it was like, are y'all really truly interested? Do y'all, are y'all really truly interested in what happens for the future of our sport? I don't think so. But now this has 
sustainability. This will be here. This ain't going nowhere. This is going to pass on down when Stroh's done, when, you know, you can go down on this, when Jason Hayward's done, when all these cats are done, they have a leg to stand on. And that's the importance of being able to get our kids back to Janelle's point of understanding what you know about our game. How do, what, how do we get here? Because mm -hmm. I was in, I was in Secaucus when Hank Aaron passed away. Mm -hmm. And to get on TV and not say one thing about his stats was how I want all our African-American mm -hmm. players to be remembered. Mm -hmm. that, that to me was powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to understand the trials and tribulations that they went through Ooh. is, is, is mind-boggling. Yes, Sleep it is. In a hotel for two months just to break mm -hmm. a record. Mm -hmm. All these things in the deep south. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we, I didn't mention one thing about it, all his accolades, not none. And I, I went through about seven hours of TV and, and just spoke from the heart about what I felt Hank Aaron, the iconic Hank Aaron. I talked to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar about Hank Aaron. Mm -hmm. Like, like we, we're in a good space right now. And I'm glad Jerry alluded to it because to me, we're in a good space to get our kids to understand that, stop thinking like, you know, I'm too this or I'm too that. Yo, you, yo, you bad. You That's know right. you bad. You know you come in with that flavor. You know you come with something different. Just go shine. Yeah. And I'll add something onto that. You mentioned the North Carolina Central Baseball Team. Yeah. So that's my mom's alma mater, but also my dad went to Grambling mm -hmm. and went there on a football scholarship initially, and mm. then turned to baseball because they said he, he would have been better at baseball. So I think we also kind of have to look at where the scouts are going to look for this talent mm -hmm. in the younger, you know, players, you know, HBCUs are just now getting the recognition that they need and they've been around forever. Right. And so if you have these teams at these schools, why not put a little bit more attention on these schools where they have teams, where they have black talent so that mm -hmm. they're able to, you know, funnel this talent up to the MLB or up to the minor leagues and get that pool of, you know, players to go there. So I think in, yes, we have to focus on the kids too, but there are also players that are all, already, you know, in the mindset of, I want to go to the big leagues, but they don't necessarily have those opportunities to do so. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know I what? Think, uh, we did, Jerry. Go ahead. Well, I mean, Jerry, just real quick. I mean, we do the Andre Dawson Classic every year. Right. We network hosted, or well, MLB hosted. We, right. we carry on our network for the day. It ain't enough. No, 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 no. It's no, not. here's, here, you, you know, the thing is, uh, it goes way back, and, and I'm sure Mark, a black history uh, professor at Duke, he probably <laughs> tell us a few things. <laughs> he go way back yeah, until uh, until I mean I was a part I was a part of the original diversity program that uh, Bud Selig put together, and we met in Milwaukee, and he comes in. And I'm so happy to put together this diversity community pro project. I said, why are we calling this diversity? We just lacking blacks. Why don't we call it what it is? It is right. We're we, we lacking <laughs> blacks. See, you can't deal with diversity until you deal with supremacy. What, what supremacy? What, 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 what is this about? Why you got to tell me what? Why aren't you training me to be an owner? or a general manager or whatever, or you just put money in my pocket to get out of my community and go to your community to build that up instead of go back and do what I have to do. So if, if you're gonna talk about diversity with me, you gotta talk about supremacy. And you know what kind of supremacy I'm talking about. That, mm -hmm. That's the only way we can get past that. But, you know, hey, uh, I've been called them many names, Malcolm X to Martin Luther King. <laughs> Keep on sleeping, you know that, right? <laughs> you, know, you know that, right? But uh, I, 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 I still believe in my heart of hearts as being a man of faith, uh, trying to live by the principles, but still 
you know, I still got some gangster proclivities, but and I'm, just, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. But, uh, you, you know, we're still trying, we're still pushing, but I, I, I would love to see uh, what Cliff is talking about is that we somehow put together some type of plan to get back to these uh, blighted communities and, and put up fields and put up instructors and put up things because I've, fortunate for me, I've been able to put a little program, a little school together out here. And we've had one kid who was homeless get a full scholarship because nobody was gonna go get him. We went and got him every day. Yeah. We had to go get him every day. He got a full scholarship. So they, there are guys that can play, but the fun, the funds to play, you don't need but one basketball. Right. You need one football. Right. And it's a glamour, it's 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 glamorous in high school right. because we doing it. And they're mm -hmm. coming to see us. But baseball, you go to a baseball field, you don't, you don't see you don't see the sisters hanging around at the baseball field like you do, you know, football at the basketball, you know. You got to decide, you got, hey, hey, well, you know, I got I to do this. And then you get you good at it, and then you say, okay, I'm going on and play college or, or, or whatever in, in, in this particular sport. But um, interesting, interesting dialogue, interesting yeah. dialogue. Jerry, I'm going to let you have the last word. Uh, I was absolutely honored to be joined today by Janelle Agee the daughter of New York Met great Tommy Agee, 1969 World Series champion. The great Cliff Floyd, who you can hear on series radio and see on MLB Network. And, and of course, the sage, the coach, the manager, <laughs> Jerry Manuel. Thank you all for joining us today for this great conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.